I called you like 17 times. And I left messages. <laughs> And I even say dirty things on it to think that will make you mad and get you all fired up and you'll call me and you're just like, oh, oh, yes, the <laughs> phone, bam, oh, yeah, I got my own show and that skateboard and shoes got my names on it. If you were a fan of Viva La Bam or CKY back in the day, there's a very good chance that you have fond memories of Bloodhound Gang. For example, watching Bam slap the S-H-I-T out of Jimmy Pop during the ending credits to CKY4. Or maybe when they made out with Don Vito on stage. You may also remember them for their song, The Bad Touch, AKA the Discovery Channel song, where they dress up like monkeys and dart and kidnap a bunch of women off the street. They were absolutely everywhere back in the 2000s. And if you were 14 years old back then, or you were like me and you just had the mental maturity of a 14 year old, then you probably loved them. But suddenly in the late 2000s, they just kind of fell off the map. They stopped making music, they stopped touring. And so I wondered whatever happened to Bloodhound Gang? How did they end up having beef with Vladimir Putin of all people? And how quickly would they get canceled if they came out today? Those are the questions that I will try to answer in this video. And also I'd like to thank Factor for sponsoring this video. Forget about all those frantic lunch preps and rushed dinners. You can say goodbye to all of that and say hello to Factor's two minute meals, your secret weapon for the new year. That means you can skip the trips to the grocery store and all the chopping and the prep and the cleanup and all that while still getting the flavor and nutrition that you need. And if you eat out a lot, it's also a great way to save money. Factor is cheaper than takeout or even worse getting delivery. And Factor also has a ton of options. Personally, I like Calorie Smart, which is less than 550 calories per serving, but they also have a ton of options like keto, vegan and veggie, and even more. Personally, I don't really enjoy cooking, so I love that I don't have to think about what what to make for lunch. I just pick something out of the fridge and I know that it's gonna taste good and I'm also gonna hit my macro goals. So if you wanna check out Factor, and honestly, I think you should, head to factor75.com or click the link below and use the code PUNK50 to get 50% off your first Factor box and free wellness shots for life. Two free wellness shots from three available flavors for every order while you're an active subscriber. Bloodhound Gang formed back in 1992, taking their name from an 80s TV show about a team of teenage detectives. Whenever there's trouble, we're the double, we're the Gang. They quickly recorded a couple demos, played some local shows, and had something like a dozen members come and go within the space of like two years, but didn't get any real traction until their 1994 demo, which had, let's just say, a very edgy title. I, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but your second demo was called Hitler's Handicapped Helpers. Right. So I, I thought you had maybe like a sick fascination for Nazis uh, or something. Uh, Somehow or another, this EP called Hitler's Handicapped Helpers, which made light of the Holocaust and disabled people, somehow was their first breakthrough, which got them signed to a small label called Cheese Factory Records, where they released their first EP called Dingleberry Hayes. And in 1995, they signed with Columbia Records. And if you're wondering how in the hell a major label signed a band with an album named after Hitler, well, I don't know what to say. It was the 90s. Every label was trying to find the next Green Day or The Offspring, throwing money at pretty much anyone that seemed like they had that potential. And the Bloodhound Gang were probably the beneficiaries of that. And shortly after that, they released their first album called Use Your Fingers, which was very much picking up where the Beastie Boys left off. But unlike the Beastie Boys, this was not exactly politically correct. For example, the song She Ain't Got No Legs. Baby, yeah. First time I saw you, Don, I knew I was in love. Tell her, Daddy. The way you took your wheelchair up that handicap ramp. Mm, it's mind blowing. And as you can imagine, the album wasn't heavily promoted by Columbia. And so, of course, the sales of the album were weak. And because of that, they got dropped by the label shortly after the album came out. 
And to make things even worse, the entire band left with the exception of the vocalist and primary songwriter, Jimmy Pop. And normally this would be the kiss of death for a band, right? But for Bloodhound Gang, it was exactly what they needed. They came back with their second album, One Fierce Beer Coaster in 1996, which mostly walked away from the Beastie Boys hip hop thing and went in more of an alternative rock direction. And if you thought they were also going to walk away from the crude humor of their earlier stuff and the Hitler EP, well, you would be very wrong. For example, the song, I Wish I Was Queer So I Could Get Chicks. Or Yellow Fever, which is about exactly what you would guess based on the title. And if you're thinking, wait a minute, that song's not on this album, that is because their label was so upset about it that they removed it from future pressings of the album. And with this album, they also found their first breakthrough hit, Fire Water Burn. We don't need no water. And that hit came through 107.7 The End in Seattle, my hometown's alternative radio station, who picked the song up after an intern recommended it to their music director, which in turn led to it getting picked up by the legendary and very influential radio station KROQ in Los Angeles. And you might be wondering how in the world a band with songs about Hitler going gay to get girls and objectifying Asian women could possibly get so popular, but it actually kind of made sense at the time if you look at it in context. This is right around the time when this kind of edgy humor was getting popular in response to the rise of what back then was called political correctness. For example, the classic movie PCU. You went out with a white male? I was a freshman. Fresh person, please. Please. Or maybe the biggest example, South Park, which was easily the most popular and controversial show of the late 90s. And what was the Bloodhound Gang really, but just the musical version of South Park? What well, we just want, always made songs that would make our friends laugh. It just so happens some people get offended by things like that. And so, yes, if you look at it through the lens of today, it's incredibly shocking and you can't imagine this getting any sort of mainstream attention whatsoever. Based in the context of the late 90s, it actually made sense that this album was a hit. It went gold in 1998, and with that, the Bloodhound Gang had officially arrived. As their manager remembered, then labels started calling, including Madonna's label Maverick, who really wanted to sign the band in the worst possible way, even to the point where I had to tell Madonna that I couldn't put her on the phone with Jimmy Pop. And with that traction, they finally did their first real national tours and hit the promotional circuit hard, appearing on all the big 90s talk shows like Howard Stern and Ricky Lake. And my personal favorite is their appearance on Loveline, where within seconds of appearing on the show, they immediately assaulted Adam Carolla. You didn't do that when you came in the radio studio. All of which set the stage for their next album, Hooray for Boobies, in 1999. But before I get to that, I wanted to mention my second YouTube channel, which is a little bit more fun, silly kind of content than what you see on this channel. So if you like that and you want to hear me talk shit about butt rock and new metal bands from the 2000s, hit the link in the description of this video. But getting back to this album with Hooray for Boobies, once again, they made absolutely no attempt to tone down their humor. If anything, they took it even further. For example, a lap dance is so much better when the stripper is crying. Yes, the lap better when the stripper is crying. Or the ballad of Chasey Lane, which is kind of like their version of Stan by Eminem, except it's about Jimmy Pop's obsession with the uh, adult entertainer Chasey Lane and what he would like to do to her butt. As your biggest fan, I must be man, you let me eat your ass. But the real highlight of this album was the breakthrough single, The Bad Touch. which I don't know if people know this, but the title of the song comes from all the programs they would give us back in the 80s in school where they would warn us about getting molested by the neighbor or whatever, and they would refer to that as the bad touch. So despite the fact that the song was a reference to something very, very dark, it went to number one in something like 10 countries and became a legitimate mainstream hit despite being initially written off by critics as just another kind of novelty flash in the pan song that would be gone in a week. Gold records, obviously not a whole lot from America. America, but uh, if you're wanting to look, uh, look and see what happens when uh, you sell 50 records in Denmark, right here. And I think a lot of what actually made the song so successful is the fact that it was controversial. 
especially the video. First of all, because the entire premise is that they're shooting women with tranquilizer darts in the street and throwing them over their shoulder and kidnapping them, as well as the scene where they attack two obviously gay men with baguettes. And so that made a lot of people write the band off as I guess you could say like horny frat boy trash. For example, Entertainment Weekly's review of the album said, these knuckleheads tap into 80s style metal and new orderish dance wave to back their dumbbell odes to oral sex, porn stars, revenge, and did I mention oral sex? And so let's talk about that. Is that really an accurate assessment of the Bloodhound Gang? I'm not so sure that it is. On the one hand, obviously, yes, they're pretty juvenile and probably most of their songs do involve penises in one way or another. But to me, a song like Mope says a lot about the other side of the band. The song samples a really wide variety of artists like Metallica, Frankie Goes to Hollywood, and Falco. And the lyrics are just like a nonstop stream of genuinely clever references to pop culture. Everything from like Tori Spelling and My So-Called Life and Pac-Man to Etch-A-Sketch, Floby, and Bo Jackson. So are they obsessed with their dicks? Yes, they are very obsessed. But I think they're also genuinely really gifted songwriters. Like the chorus of The Bad Touch is just legitimately a great hook any way you want to look at it. And I think the rest of their catalog is full of the same. And with all of that being said, the album quickly went multi-platinum and they spent the next 18 months on the road playing with everybody from ACDC to Social Distortion, Korn, Faith No More, and literally hundreds more. Which if that's all they did would be impressive enough, but that is not all they were up to. Around Around the same time they were blowing up with Hooray for Boobies, a skateboarder from Westchester, Pennsylvania was also blowing up by the name of Bam Margera. As you probably know, Bam initially made a name for himself with the CKY videos that he made with his brother and their friends, which then essentially combined with the Big Brother crew from LA to become Jackass. The show was a massive hit, and once Jackass was over, Bam got his own show called Viva La Bam, which was a more scripted show that ostensibly documented Bam's life back in Westchester in Castle Bam and all the crazy things that he got into with his friends. And music was always a big part of what you could call the CKY extended universe maybe most notably the band Him. And starting with Viva La Bam, Bloodhound Gang became part of that as well and started making regular appearances. A few of the most iconic moments from that era include the scavenger hunt episode, where the crew has to check off a bunch of ridiculous stunts from a list, including bowling a strike with Bloodhound Gang with their bowling shoes full of cheese. We got a bowl of strike with cheese in our shoes. Oh, right, you're putting cheese in your shoes? All right, I gotta check this out. <laughs> or the episode where Bam teaches Phil and Don Vito to become rock stars with the help of CKY, Him, and Bloodhound Gang. Bloodhound and other bands like Him have been trying to teach Phil Margera and Don Vito how to be rock stars. Hey, Phil, Don Vito! I had a tattoo guy backstage giving Don Vito a tattoo, and I want to show everybody. It's on his ass. I see what's happening. Really spicy. All of which leads up to the moment of Jimmy Pop making out with Don Vito on stage. Something that honestly, I kind of wish I had never seen. You know what's really good in, in music? Everybody around here had a French kiss. So you know, I'm going to French kiss Don Vito. Don Vito, you know what I mean? In the legendary limo versus Lambo segment, where Bam and Jimmy Pop take Bam's Lamborghini and race it against a limo driven by Don Vito and Ryan Dunn, rest in peace. But if I win, you have to wear a cabaret showgirl outfit in the Kilders and French rap. <laughs> what? <laughs> Shut up. They also showed up in one of my very favorite CKY4 segments with Bam, Jimmy, and the rest of the gang just slapping each other absolutely senseless. followed by Evil Jared giving Chris Rabb head trauma. Her injuries incurred through a shopping cart to a brick wall to heal a shopping cart even faster into a Mac machine. <laughs> and even more head trauma when Bam did a backflip off of Jared's banana car on an episode of MTV Cribs. Oh. 
which he later revealed cut him so badly that he had to get 16 staples in his head. Because I got 16 staples in the head from cracking my head open from uh, filming the Bloodhound Gang uh, um, Cribs episode. and then There's also the DiCamillo sisters, which was the Bloodhound Gang, plus Brandon DiCamillo and some other of the CKY crew members. And after that whirlwind of videos, touring, TV, and promotional appearances, the band was, to put it bluntly, exhausted and at each other's throats. Well, our last record, uh, we, we went on tour for 18 months, mm -hmm. and then we hated each other after that. So we just took a break because uh, our record company would love you to record and tour, record, tour, record, tour. But it's the same record company that uh, drove Axl Rose crazy, killed Kurt Cobain, and uh, oh, turned Rivers from Weezer into a nerd. But after taking a break from the band and each other, they came back with their fourth album in 2005 called Hefty Fine. The title coming from the time that Jared had to pay a $10,000 fine for urinating in public during the filming of Viva La Bam. And once again, if you thought that they were gonna change their tune and start doing something more mature, well, you would be very wrong. First of all, the cover art is a naked fat guy with his dong just barely concealed by the shadows. And the first single was called Foxtrot Uniform Charlie Kilo. In other words, F-U-C-K. And the video features Bam Margera driving the banana car into a tunnel that looks suspiciously like, well, I'll let you guess what they were referring to. And to cap it all off, they end the video with a shot of an old man eating a banana, let's just say very enthusiastically. And they followed that up with their next single, Untis, 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 which ironically ended up being a top 40 hit in a lot of the European countries that it was specifically making fun of. And in typical Bloodhound Gang fashion, the video involves Jimmy Pop spying on a girl in the bathroom through a hole in the wall. Clearly, this was the same old Bloodhound Gang that we knew and loved. But as far as new music and the future of the band, things were much less clear. They wouldn't release new music for many years until eventually putting out the single All Together Uki in 2010. And despite the band mentioning many times that new music was in the works, nothing seemed to really materialize. But anybody who thought the Bloodhound Gang were going to mellow out would once again be very disappointed. For example, the time that they literally got in trouble with Vladimir Putin for going to Ukraine and wiping their ass with the Russian flag. Don't tell Putin. <laughs> Who would have ever thought that the Bloodhound Gang would be at the center of an international diplomatic incident? And they eventually did release their most recent album, Hard Off, in 2015. Once again, a dick joke. Although, from what I can tell, the band was essentially broken up at the time, and this was really more of like a Jimmy Pop solo project. And from what I understand, the answer to the question of whatever happened to Bloodhound Gang is that they essentially just quietly retired. No drama, no big announcements, just kind of gracefully stepping out of the spotlight other than the few times that Jimmy gets spotted at baseball games or pro wrestling shows, which if you ask me is kind of the perfect way to cap off a great career full of underratedly brilliant music. We've learned one thing throughout this experience, it's this. It's much better to listen to the Bloodhound Gang than hang out with the Bloodhound Gang. I mean that in the best way, Jared. All right, my friends, that does it for this video. As always, let me know what you think in the comments. And also, I would like to thank everyone who supports me on Patreon, especially those of you who support at the True Cult level or above. Patrons get all my videos early. There are members-only channels on my Discord. I do Q&As. And there is also a way to have me review your music. So if any of that sounds cool, hit the link in the description of this video. And with that, I'm gonna sign off for now, but I will see you next time.